environmental justice. As I've mentioned several times, I know more or less jack about environmental policy, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, I try to do my part. I, in fact, biked here for environment today, so um, I have put off peak oil for all of you by about another 38 seconds. You can thank me later after you have listened to the lecture. One thing to keep in mind, just for context as we go through this, is that to some extent the kinds of issues that arise for environmental justice may be assimilable to issues that arise for poverty, poverty or other kinds of resource distribution and redistribution. Uh, basically, if you think that the issue with having a crummy environmental situation is basically the same as being deprived of any other kind of material good, then a lot of the same things that can be said about poverty can be said about the environment. However, there are some possible uh, additional kinds of concerns that might come up. But certainly in the uh, Sunstein piece, Sunstein positive piece on uh, uh, environmental redistribution towards future generations, um, and even in the Peter Singer piece, you will see that this looks a lot like discussions of poverty um, and may even be connected to them. Uh, you'll see, however, of course, in the Sagoff piece that there might be other ways of thinking about it. And as a policy person, um, what kind of model you use for approaching the environment may actually be pretty important. But let's get down to the nitty gritty. So big issues for environmental justice. Um, the first is just environmental quality is important to how well your life is going. Uh, even if you are not an avid outdoorsman, the quality of the environment matters for your life. Uh, you need clean water, you need reasonably clean air, you need uh, plants and possibly animals to eat, uh, that sort of thing. So, like anything else, uh, you know, the reason we care about it is that it affects how well our lives are going. Similarly to the poverty issue, um, different people have different impact from the environment. Uh, there are some extremes of this. Uh, we were just talking in my international law class uh, the other day about the Maldives. Um, if global warming continues, the Maldives may go away. There may no longer be a Maldives. Um, other people will be harmed in less dramatic fashion if the current models of, of climate change uh, go on. The increased desertification in the Sahara. Some of them will actually be benefited. Uh, to my understanding, that current models of climate change predict that, for instance, parts of Russia and of Canada that are currently too cold for serious agriculture may become bread baskets. So some, some people will actually benefit from climate change. And the distribution of this is not in any obvious sense fair. The Maldives are not reaping the penalty for being excessive polluters if they go underwater. In fact, they're a pretty small country that probably does less than its share of, of pollution. So we might, as a policy matter, think that there's some reason for us to do something about this, at least if we can. In addition to being inequitably distributed across people now, the burdens will also be distributed inequitably across generations. Um, when I drive my Hummer down to the corner store and then leave it idling for 20 minutes, uh, that's great for me because it stays nice and warm and toasty in the, in, the, in the Hummer, you know. I don't have to change my radio presets and sort of blast it out the windows while I'm in the store, get all of that good stuff. But, you know, my daughter may not be very happy about this when she has to pay for more expensive oil or when there's worse pollution and that sort of thing. And, you know, she has no control over this. Uh, I mean, every time she tries to tell me to turn the car off, I just ignore her. She's four. You know, she can't do anything about it. Uh, and the last part of this, to keep in mind, this goes back to what I was saying a minute ago, is aside from these issues about the burdens that it inflicts on people, maybe we have some inherent reasons to protect the environment. And maybe the environment is valuable even aside from any effect it has on people. And again, as a policymaker, it'll be a, it's a kind of a deep question how, if at all, you take any of that sort of thing into account. So let's start with this last question, this question about why the environment 
is valuable? The most obvious answer, and this goes back to the, this is the taxonomy from this, the Zuckerman's Dilemma piece. Uh, hoping all of you get the reference. Uh, if you don't, Charlotte's Web, it's, it's a nice little charming little book. Um, so the first way in which we might value the environment is instrumentally. This is kind of the most obvious way. It's the way that is perhaps most natural for policymakers to think about. And this is just to value the environment because of the way that it impacts human interests. Um, in this sense, clean air is not valuable for any reason except for the fact that people who breathe dirty air don't like it. People who breathe dirty air may have certain kinds of health problems, that sort of thing. One important so there's, there's two important bits of this. One is that this makes humans the locus of all value, uh, which, you know, it's an interesting moral perspective. Uh, not necessarily a bad one, even though it can sound a little bit, um, a little bit harsh when put that bluntly. It's just anthropocentric. In this sense, um, only what matters to humans matters. The other part of this, and that's maybe a little bit more immediately pressing for policymakers is that if your perspective is instrumental, one thing that happens is that the environment becomes really, really fungible. It becomes a very, very substitutable value, maybe is a better better term than fungible. Uh, this comes out really strongly in the Sunstein piece, and it's kind of a suppressed ethical premise of their piece, is that if all that matters about the environment is its instrumental value, then if we can replace a healthy environment with some other instrument for achieving the same goals for human beings, it's exactly as good, right? So this is sort of the idea that if we make the world a lot, um, say, warmer, you know, you end up with a situation where uh, global warming makes it uncomfortably hot in a lot of places, but economic growth is such that everyone can have an air conditioner, then this might be a wash on this kind of perspective. If you can, you know, that's a crude analogy, but the idea is that if you can exactly compensate for the bad things of environmental degradation, either by finding some other way to get the thing that you want the environment for, or by providing somebody with something that they like just as much, right? Where if you say, you know, these are the standard kinds of microeconomic bets. If you say, if, if someone is indifferent between a world with lots of biodiversity um, and a world with less biodiversity, but where they have a Lamborghini, well, you know, the Lamborghini's not doing the same thing, but at least if they value it equally, then that should be kind of an ethical wash. It should be, you should be morally indifferent between the two if the interests are served equally well. For a lot of people, uh, a lot of people resist looking at the environment just in that kind of way. Um, to a lot of people, this doesn't seem to capture it quite right. And this goes, to some extent, this goes a little bit back towards what we were talking about with utilitarianism's problems a few weeks ago. Uh, there's, to a lot of people, it seems a little bit off to talk about something like how many disappeared species could you compensate for by giving everyone a Lamborghini? Uh, it, it just seems odd and possibly incomparable. And those folks may be thinking about, uh, those folks, maybe some of you, maybe many of you, may be thinking about the environment in at least one of two additional ways. Almost nobody denies that the environment has an instrumental value. Uh, and nobody probably denies that it has an instrumental value. But it might other also have at least two other kinds of values. One is that it might have an aesthetic value. Uh, and this is a little bit of a, of a, can be a little bit of a mushy concept. The general intuitive idea is that the environment might be valuable, in addition to its instrumental value, might be valuable because it has an inherent beauty to it. Um, in this sense, it is like art. Art is not quite
comparable, a lot of people think, to other kinds of things that you might have. Uh, so you might capture some of this how many species of Orville Lamborghini kind of issue by thinking of the environment as having an inherent aesthetic value. Um, you know, even if you could sell the Mona Lisa and buy lots and lots of hamburgers, to a lot of people it just seems wrong to try to make aesthetic values uh, convertible that way. On the other hand, aesthetic value is still about what the environment means to people. Um, if we care about forests, not just because they're carbon sinks, but also because they're beautiful, well, we're caring about them still in an anthropocentric way. We're still caring about what they mean to human beings. Um, and on this kind of valuation, uh, you know, a beautiful forest that no one could ever visit might not have any sort of meaningful value. Um, but it might still give it a different kind of value than, than an instrument. And then the third, and to some extent, um, in some sense, the strongest kind of value that you might place on the environment, not strongest in that, in that it's the most valuable necessarily, but strongest in that it is the most restrictive and the most kind of metaphysically weighty. Um, is that the environment might have a kind of independent moral standing. In this sense, the environment is important in and of itself, regardless of its impact on human interests, and even regardless of the ways in which humans might value it non-instrumentally uh, in an aesthetic way. The easiest, I think, the, the, the easiest case to make this for is for non-human animals. Uh, there are a lot of people who find it very plausible to think that non-human animals have rights that are at least to some extent similar to the rights that human beings have. This is a very common reason, for instance, why people become vegetarians. Um, if you are this kind of vegetarian, the idea is that it's not that you are not eating a pig because you know, you're better served by keeping the pig alive. It's not that you're not eating the pig because you really, pigs are beautiful and noble and majestic animals and you would rather contemplate their, their beauty than eat them. Um, you're not eating the pig because, you know, pigs shouldn't be eaten. The same reason why you wouldn't eat a person, right? When I think about, hmm, should I eat a person today? I don't think, well, this person, are they worth more to me alive than in my belly? This person, do I think they're do I think they're they're attractive? Do I do I like ogling this person better than I would like devouring them? No, if I you know it, it's one of those things where if I'm even asking the question, do I prefer ogling a person to devouring him? Um, probably I'm crazy. A lot of people see animals the same way, and we talked about this a little bit back when we talked about utilitarianism. If you think that animals share a kind of, share the basis of moral standing with people, you may very well be willing to extend them a kind of moral status. Uh, if you're a utilitarian, lots of utilitarians um, are, uh, are vegetarians and are interested in animal rights. Uh, Peter Singer, notably among them, wrote a book called Animal Liberation that's popular among uh, animal rights activists. Lots of utilitarians will say, for instance, hey, you know what? Animals feel pleasure and pain. Animals have preferences. Animals can be happy or sad. Therefore, they have the same kind of moral standing that human beings do. Um, Non-utilitarians might also think this. There's some dispute among non-utilitarians about what the basis of morality is. Uh, but, you know, even Kantians uh, might feel a bit of a pull of this. For a lot of people who otherwise don't have any problem with eating meat, for instance, the thought of eating a dolphin, or a gorilla, or a monkey, or some other animal that we believe has some degree of higher cognitive capabilities is abhorrent. Right? There are plenty of people who eat meat who, if I said, look, here, have some delicious gorilla, would be, would be horrified by this. Now, as a side issue, there are plenty of people who eat meat who, if I said, you know, here have this delicious snake would be horrified and that's a cultural bound issue. And there probably is something cultural about the gorilla example too. But at least the way that people will think about it often is that monkeys and gorillas, they have kind of 
communication that's at least similar to a rudimentary language. They use tools. Um, they do all sorts of things that make them person-like, even though they are not human beings. Okay, so the case can be made fairly plausibly for um, the inherent moral value of animals. I think uh, at least even most people who are not vegetarians or vegans, you can probably see the pull of that argument for vegetarians and vegans. You can understand why someone would end up being a vegetarian or a vegan. There are, um, and this tends to be more radical, there are theorists who want to put an inherent moral value on other kinds of environmental features similar to the one we place on, uh, that some people place on animals. Uh, so this would be to say that the same reason that you may think it's wrong to kill a pig for food just because of the wrongness of doing that to, to a pig that you know, never did anything to you. Um, speaking of, there's a farm near us where we get our food, and pigs are huge. My big worry about killing the pigs is that these pigs like this has a minivan. So they're going to come after us if they figure out what's going on. But that's an aside. That's instrumental value, worrying about the pig uprising. All right, moving back to the moral stuff. The same way that a lot of people think that it would be wrong to kill a pig just because of the badness of, for the pig, there are people who think that it's wrong to destroy plants, um, you know, not necessarily to use them at all, but to, to wantonly destroy, say, a forest, or wrong to level mountains uh, for mining just because of the badness of this for the plants, or the badness of this for the mountains, their inherent moral standing. Now, given that mountains and plants and things like that tend not to have the moral well, except for folks who believe in things like the Gaia hypothesis where everything is, is animate. For most of us, because we don't tend to think that mountains and plants share the basis for moral standing that uh, humans have and that animals more plausibly share, this tends to be a bit of a more radical view. Um, and it can also, for folks who do not hold something like the Gaia hypothesis, um, it can be a little bit hard to distinguish this from the aesthetic of you. But it's out there, it's, and it's, it's worth considering. Um, you know, would it, be, would it be wrong to destroy a mountain just because you shouldn't do that to mountains? All right. So, let's leave aside for a moment the deep, bloggy questions about why we value the environment and focus on the easiest and most tractable and yet still difficult question for policymakers, which is, if we, uh, even if we focus on the instrumental value of the environment, there are a number of questions about how we ought to respond to that, and in particular, how we ought to respond to the problem of environmental damage and environmental degradation. Um, by the way, in all of this, I'm not trying to take any particularly controversial stands on things like climate change. Even if you don't believe in things like overall climate change or if you don't believe that it's human driven, there are plenty of other ways in which humans clearly have an impact on the environment that is uh, detrimental to at least some people. So you can worry about, you should be worried about all of this stuff or at least a lot of this stuff, even if you know, you think that sunspots are causing climate change, um, or that climate change isn't happening, or it's overblown, or anything like that. Because there's still all sorts of other ways in which we affect the environment. We put pollution in the water, uh, we put pollution in the air, you know, um, we kill off species, uh, that sort of thing. You know, we, we, we wreck the Chesapeake Bay so that we have to import all of our crabs from China, or at least a lot of them, I'm told, so that sort of thing. Okay. So, like I said, some of the same things apply to the environment that apply to uh, things like poverty. When you think of things purely from the perspective of how do we distribute the costs of environmental degradation around the world. But there are a couple interesting things that you might want to think about specifically for the environment. The first is, um, given that all of our economic activity, stuff that we want to do, has some kind of impact on the environment that, that degrades the environment in a number of ways, how do we determine who should bear the costs of the environmental degradation? Um, letting the chips fall where they may seems plausibly unfair. 
it might be fair from a kind of libertarian perspective, right? If you're if you're a libertarian, you might say, look, um, these are just the rules. Uh, the 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 Maldives are sinking, but you know, it's similar to people being poor through no direct fault of my own. I'm not pouring water on the Maldives, and I'm just doing stuff. I'm not doing anything that doesn't involve a kind of voluntary contract. Well, there are a couple limitations to this perspective. One is that, in a even more clear way than poverty, people who are, especially people who are in the affluent world, are directly involved with environmental degradation, if in a very diffuse way. Um, it's hard to say that the coffee I buy this morning, the electricity used to brew it, you know, is directly raising the Maldives by one one hundredth of a thousandth of a millimeter, uh, the sea level around the Maldives. But nonetheless, we, we know that, we, you know, again, at least if you aren't skeptical of the science, we, we, we know that that's why it's happening. It's happening through all sorts of little, little tiny contributions by people. The other, and this is a, a fav was a favorite hobby horse of some of the, the legal realists. Um, that's a whole another can of worms. The other thing is that part of the problem with the environment might have to do with the patterns of what we allow to be owned in our society. So some folks will point out, look, uh, and, and um, Singer sort of leans in this direction, you say, look, the reason, part of the reason why um, you can use hydrocarbons so cheaply in our world is that we don't allow people to own air individually. If you allowed me to own a chunk of the air that was mine, well then, if you wanted to drive your car in such a way that your exhaust fumes would get into my air, well then you'd have to sign some sort of contract with me, and quite plausibly I would charge you for it. I might, you know, I might not charge you a lot, but I might say, oh, everyone who drives their Humvee in Baltimore has to pay me a nickel, because you're going to degrade some of my air. And if you don't want to pay me a nickel, no deal. Uh, you know, this would be air on the model of other kinds of property, right? The same way that you can't drive your Humvee across my backyard without checking with me first. I get to I get to own my backyard, but I don't get to own the air above my backyard. If you leave it idling on the street next to me, suddenly I can't do anything. Um, and there are folks, the legal realists like to point out that the, the things that we allow to be property are kind of arbitrary. Um, and so there are folks who say, look, basically part of the problem is that we, we have a system set up where the rules don't allow you to own some of the important environmental things. Yeah, there are good reasons why we have the system like this. I mean, it would be a logistical nightmare if you allowed people to own chunks of air, right? I mean, how do I put barriers up around my air? How do you contract with all these people that you're going to pay nickels to every time you drive your car through Baltimore? Yada, yada, yada. This would be a nightmare. You, no one would want to do it that way, and it's a good reason why we don't have private property rights in something, something like air. Um, but at the same time, there have been folks who, even from a basically libertarian perspective, have wanted to um, say, well, maybe this is why we can have uh, taxes on things like carbon use. Because the taxes are there to simulate what the world would be like if I was allowed to own the air. Um, you know, where we, it simulates the increased cost and that we use those taxes to pay for things like environmental cleanup that simulates the kind of thing that I would do if I owned air, right? I'd take all your nickels and I would use it to buy a fan to blow smog out of my air, something like that. Or I'd use it to buy the Lamborghini that I want better, more than I want clean air, that sort of thing. Okay, so this, all of this brings us to this question of once you decide that somebody's going to pay for all of this, you have a question of who's going to pay? One principle, and this is the one friendliest to a kind of libertarian -y kind of picture, is well, the polluter pays. This is like what you would get if you own the air, except you do it on a large scale. It's a historical principle. It seems fair because the fairness is based on who did the damage. You know, what can be fairer than that to some extent? If I, you know, it seems fair even in, in respecting people's choices, right? Uh, 
if we make polluters pay for the costs of their pollution in some way, we, we use it to, to clean things up or we just distribute it to everyone who's harmed by the pollution, um, then it makes sense of the choices, right? If you really want to drive your Humvee around Baltimore, then, then great. You're allowed to do that. You're just going to pay like an extra 50 bucks a day for, the, for, for all of the environmental degradation you're doing. If I want to ride my bike around Baltimore, that's, that's great too. I put up with the freaking headwinds on days like today. Um, but, you know, I save myself 50 bucks a day over, over driving the Humvee around. Uh, so this seems really fair in a lot of ways. There are, of course, problems with it. Um, one is that environmental degradation is really diffuse. Unless you adopt some kind of approximation, like taxing people who, you know, taxing gasoline because it creates carbon, um, well, it's going to be really hard to assess it. It's going to be really hard to tell who did what because the kind of damage that is done to the environment is typically extremely diffuse. And in fact, this is, this is most often the way it's done. Um, when there are concerns about environmental degradation, uh, it's most often looked at on the model of market share kinds of legislation in, in the law. So one of the reasons we're sure talks about RU486, uh, not, sorry, bleh, not RU486, totally different thing, thalidomide. Um, tell us about thalidomide. So thalidomide was used, it was um, intended to uh, help women in their pregnancy. Uh, it turns out to cause serious birth defects in some cases. It has to do with the structure of the molecules, this sort of thing. Well, one of the problems, once this was realized, people understandably wanted to get compensation for it. But one of the problems was that uh, women would often take thalidomide that might be produced by a couple different producers. And it was almost impossible to say, oh, it was the thalidomide pill you took on Tuesday, not the one you took on Thursday, that caused the birth defects. So when they assessed damages for this, um, they often did it in market share fashion. They assessed damage on the companies that made it based on how much of it they, they made. You could do this for pollution as well. And this is basically what, what's going on when you tax things like gasoline. Um, you're saying if you use more gasoline, you're putting more carbon into the air. You know, I can't tell that your Humvee released the carbon atoms that, you know, caused my tomato plants to scorch in, the, in, in last year's excessive heat. But there's no way I could, I could assess that to you. But we can say, well, people who drive Humvees contribute more to this than people who ride bikes. And we can assess it that way. The problem with this, though, is that the more you do this, um, the further and further you get away from the intuitive fairness of, of things. Um, especially if you start saying things like, well, we're, we're going to tax, but we're not going to give it back to people who are harmed. We're going to give it to everybody. Or we're not going to give it to everybody. You know, so we're, we're going to give it to, to me who lost my tomatoes, but also to people who, who didn't grow tomatoes in the first place, right? Um, or especially if you say, we're not even going to give it to everybody. We're going to use it to pay for other kinds of things. We're going to use it to pay for, you know, um, environmental cleanups elsewhere, right? Where suddenly, you know, you drive your Humvee, contribute to the scorching of my tomatoes, and then you end up paying money to clean up the Hudson River in New York. You know, this, this gets very, very far away from the intuitive fairness that was behind the polluter pays principle. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that the further you get away from the completely non-implementable direct fairness kind of model of this, uh, the, it, it loses a lot of the attraction, especially to people with kind of more libertarian leanings. Okay. It does also raise problems about who to blame for actions of bygone polluters. Right. It raises some questions. This comes up with poverty, too. It raises some questions about, well, look, a huge portion of climate change, for instance, is a result of historical carbon use. Be the people who use that carbon, they're dead. We can't make them pay for anything. And so if you get to things like, you say, well, all right, um, Dr. Levine, we're going to make you pay for a lot of what they did. But I'm going to say to you, look, I ride a freaking bike. I own a Prius. I am a stereotypical NPR listening, you know, I listen to NPR, my solar powered radio, NPR listening, bleeding heart liberal. Why am I paying for the industrial revolution? And I say, well, because, you know, those, those people are kind of dead. 
Um, and you know, this again cuts into the intuitive fairness. Now, the kind of answer that people are typically going to give to this kind of charge of unfairness is, well, I may ride my bike around, but I benefit, I sort of structurally benefit from the actions of bygone folks. Um, and as a result, I, I didn't earn them, and people were harmed by them, so it might at least be plausibly fair to say, we can take away some of your unearned starting benefits to compensate people for the damage done by past generations. But again, this gets away from the sort of nice, clean, easy, intuitive fairness that polluter pays was supposed to capture. And finally, it raises questions about polluters who didn't realize they were polluting. Um, there's all sorts of things that uh, you know, now we understand better about environmental damage than we might have 30, 40 years ago. Uh, there are some cases in law where we want to apply what's sometimes called strict liability, where even if you could not reasonably have known or prevented something, you're still on the hook for it. But they're pretty rare. And again, it's because they go against the intuition underlying the polluter praise principle, uh, the sort of fairness of if you did it, you have to, you have to pay for it kind of thing. Um, different people dis disagree about how responsible you can or should be held for things that you didn't understand, but at least it's something that, that, that plausibly comes up and that somebody might plausibly complain about if they're being asked to pay for something that they did not realize was damaging. Okay. So what about a different kind of way? Polluter pays is backward looking. There's a different kind of way of looking at this, which is more the kind of utilitarian or liberal egalitarian friendly kind of way, uh, if you need to, to break things down that way, which is some kind of environmental redistribution. And this is largely forward looking. On this kind of model, forget about how we got here. Right? We know we're in a situation where there's there's been damage to the environment, um, where if we keep doing things the way we do them and letting the chips fall where, they're, where they may, there's likely to be additional damage to the environment, and we know that the future damage to the environment, the current environmental situation is, is not distributed in any way that looks particularly fair, um, and the future distribution of harms and benefits will not in any way clearly be fair. So what do we do about it forward-looking is the core of the environmental redistribution kind of perspective. Um, it's also, and this is another place where it's, where it's consonant with liberal egalitarianism and utilitarianism more, is that it's, a, it's, a, it's based on a snapshot of the world. It doesn't care about the history, it just cares about what does the world look like now. Um, so this goes back to this issue that the libertarians complained about, about sort of pattern-based versus procedure or historically-based kinds of uh, distribution. This is a pattern-based distribution. Um, one sort of interesting uh, bit about these first two things, by basing it on patterns, by basing it on, on uh, avoiding the past, is that this may actually privilege wealthy countries in, in some way. Uh, if you grant that wealthier countries have done more things that have contributed to the current state of environmental, environmental degradation, saying, all right, let's start from now and go forward, uh, may look a little bit unfair. Um, because typically, the way that this sort of setup would work is you, you, you say, all right, well, how much environmental capacity do we have? How much capacity do the oceans have to provide fish and to absorb pollution? How much capacity does the atmosphere have to, to absorb pollution before we cook ourselves? You know, how much capacity do forests have to regenerate before we run out of paper and other and carbon sinks and other things we want from forests? Um, you know, we figure out how much there is, and then we divide it up in some kind of equitable way. We figure out how much how much you, you can use, either a total amount or a rate, uh, to avoid the worst case outcomes, and then we, we divvy that up. All right. This seems fairly plausible. Um, you might recognize this as kind of a really abstract version of something like cap and trade, right? Where the idea behind cap and trade, at least, or some of the really abstract version of something like the RED program. The idea behind these programs is you have a certain amount of capacity and you just divide it up. You let people use it however they want, but you only give them, you only 
give them so much. So one of the questions that arises about this, though, is first ball game. So first, there's this question of is this fair, right? Um, if we ignore history in assigning this, for instance, then the amount of the future capacity that the United States receives will not in any meaningful way be based on uh, the question of how much of the world's total environmental environmental capacity did the U.S. already use up, right? That's irrelevant to this kind of question. And if you do want to ask that question, well, then you're, you might have some sort of hybrid model that you're getting back to the issues about how do we work out your pays, uh, kinds of things. Um, one of the other issues that arises is, well, assign each what? Who does this get to? I mean, cap and trade typically assigns firms uh, stuff, but, you know, that's politically feasible and sort of makes a whole lot of sense really here from a policy standpoint. Ethically may seem a little bit weird, right? You know, why why does um, whatever, why does Chrysler get carbon, you know, buy a carbon capacity and it doesn't just go to me? You know, why do they buy it from the government instead of buying it from me, for instance? Um, it also might matter, well, how exactly is this divided up? Is each country gets things? But then you're sort of, you know, everyone in the country gets thrown in the same boat, even though there might be significant environmental inequities within the country. Do we give it to individuals? That has a lot of a lot going for it in terms of intuitive ethical fairness, but you know, it comes to the problem of well, how are we how are we gonna manage this then, right? Part of the reason we have Chrysler buy carbon credits from the government rather than from me is that again we get back to this real logistical nightmare. If you say, all right, everybody on the planet gets a dollar worth of carbon, well, you know, suddenly Chrysler's gonna get into negotiations with a million people or a billion people in order to get enough uh, capacity to do what it wants to do. One side issue of this that I know comes up in some environmental policy discussions, uh, though quickly I get out of my depth on, on it, is how exactly you're going to handle the divvying up once it's there. Do you just give people their capacity to do with what they will, including, for instance, selling it to somebody else, cap and trade style? Or is it um, that that's just your your capacity? If you if you don't use it all up, fine. You have spare capacity, but you can't trade it to someone else. Um, and this would be something like just limiting carbon emissions, right? Or uh, incre putting rules to increase fuel economy are basically specific policies that are versions of a non-transferable kind of um, uh, redistribution. And one of the issues that might come come with this is that in a world of economic inequity, allowing tradeability may have certain kinds of morally questionable effects. The biggest problem that people point to is that it may create kind of um, environmental hot zones, right, where poor people basically end up living next to these incredibly concentrated uh, loci of environmental degradation and pollution because you get a kind of feedback loop, right? The, the dirtiest uh, kinds of firms will, you know, the ones that have the hardest time reducing carbon output or reducing chemical output or other kinds of things that you might, that you might split up in your environmental distribution, um, they will tend to buy all of that capacity from the, uh, from the cleaner, the companies that can operate in a cleaner fashion. Uh, they'll tend to cluster um, because they can buy land more cheaply because they're degrading it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, that's where poorer people will live because fancy middle class first worlders like me will pay money to not live next to the factory, whereas other people will live next to the factory or the giant computer garbage dump or whatever else that you have. So there might be some questions about this. Now, the flip side of it, of course, is that if you don't let people transfer it, this raises questions about freedom, right? You know, basically, if you give me a non-transferable credit um, or some sort of something that represents non-transferable uh, share of the environmental capacity of the world, well, what if I would rather have, you know, a big screen TV than cleaner air? Can't do anything about it. Or even worse, and this starts nudging towards the sun scene stuff, um, what if I'd rather have enough food to eat than cleaner air? Uh, so, like with poverty, 
you do get into some kinds of dialectics about uh, the potential coordination effects of not allowing people to choose uh, what they want to do with their stuff um, versus the potential um, freedom effects of allowing them to do what they want with their stuff. Okay. Sorry about the phone call. Uh, can't stop anyone from trying to call me uh, while I'm here in the office. Okay. So, a couple of major trade-offs that you might be worried about. Um, aside from this question about how we distribute the load, there are a couple of big trade-offs that are involved with any kind of decisions about environmental capacity. And these are the ones that, that to some extent, drive a lot of the arguments that people have. The arguments are not always phrased in the um, most perspicuous ways, and emotions tend to run high, but there's really two big sets of trade-offs that tend to underlie a lot of the environmental fights. One is, whenever you're making environmental policy, you are potentially trading off the present versus the future. Uh, so a lot of people will say, look, is there any difference between being separated in space or being separated in time? A uh, big part of what um, underlies thinking about the morality of environmental decisions has to do with the idea that uh, we need to care about future generations the way we care about ourselves. Um, but the Sunstein piece, the Sunstein imposter piece, I think raises some interesting questions about does a real strong focus on uh, environmental protection actually accurately capture that kind of intuition. In fact, what they're essentially arguing is that environmental protection might actually favor wealthier people and future people over uh, poorer people. Um, get to that in a second. The more obvious question is how do we and, and do we discount for future generations? Um, does it matter when I'm trying to do my policy calculation that someone is going to live 15 generations in the future? versus my children, or my grandchildren, or versus people now. Um, and it raises some ethical questions about the practice of discounting. So um, you can, in, in economics, you almost always discount future things. The ethical basis of it is a little bit murky. The typical reasoning is, well, we're going to discount future generations not because we care less about them, but because we have less certainty about what will happen, right? Fifteen generations out, I don't know what the world's going to look like. You will sometimes get a retort from, from the ethical side of things that, okay, yeah, you're saying you're doing it because of uncertainty, but the, but the effect is often to not treat their interests as, as seriously. And with the environment, one of the things that comes in here is, can we assume that there's going to be any kind of important technological change, right? Um, if you assume that, well, 15 generations from now, you know, people are going to live on the moon and and all their cars will be will be will be run by the power of imagination. Well, sure. Then who cares how much carbon I use now? Um, but there are some deep questions about this, and there are a lot of people, sci there are scientists who work pretty hard on questions of can you know. What kind of technological change can we assume, can, can we count on, and also how quickly can it come? You'll sometimes see, uh, you will often see people arguing not just that 15 generations from now we don't know what things are going to be like, but that two or three generations from now, oh, you know, we'll probably have worked out safe nuclear, uh, or we'll probably have gotten fusion working properly, or we'll probably have figured out how to do carbon sequestration. And you know, one of the questions is, uh, does the uncertainty on the, does the sort of upside uncertainty justify discounting formally or informally the effects of our current actions on the well-being of future people? Okay. The interesting bit, and the reason I give you the, the Sunstein Posser article, is that there's also an interesting question about what kind of effect on broader inequity in the world focus on environmental protection has. And now the positive and sensing piece can be a little bit complicated to work through, but here's the basic idea. If we look at history, we can make a reasonable projection that 
future people will be wealthier than current people. Now, the first thing that the radical environmentalists are going to say is, no, no, it's not going to work that way. But take them at their word for the moment, at least to understand the structure of the argument. Um, even in really poor places, economic growth tends to be positive. Uh, you know, it might not be very strongly positive, but it tends to be positive. So future people are going to be wealthier than current people. The other bit of the argument that's important is they say, look, protecting the environment will not just help future poor people, right, people who are relatively poor in the future. It will help relatively rich people, right? Um, if we, if we, if we limit environmental degradation, this will help future Bangladeshis, but it also helps future Americans. So what they say is, if you take these two things, future people are richer than current people, and environmental benefits are distributed widely and so will tend to help future rich people as well as future poor people, you get a sort of a weird result, um, which is you end up saying, all right, if we take money away from, say, international aid, and we spend it on environmental protection. What this does is this harms the current Bangladeshis in order to benefit both future Bangladeshis and future Americans. I don't mean to be picking on Bangladesh, but it's a place that's probably going to be pretty hit by, pretty hard hit by environmental change, looks like. And what Silicon and Pazar asks is, is, is this actually what equity demands of us, right? First of all, it seems really bizarre to say that we ought to take some money from current Americans to help current Bangladeshis, right? Most people believe that we ought to give some kind of international aid. Right? It seems odd to say that we ought to hurt current Americans to help current Bangladeshis, but it's okay to hurt current Bangladeshis to help future Americans, right? Well, why should that be? The other part of it that can look weird is you end up saying, well, it also looks like we're saying um, we ought to help, um, we ought to hurt current Bangladeshis in order to help future Bangladeshis. And what Sunstein and Pazra point out is, look, um, future Bangladeshis are going to be wealthier than current Bangladeshis. So you've got a similar kind of problem to the Americans, to the issue about helping Americans at the expense of Bangladesh. It seems like you're taking, if you imagine you've got these four, these, these, these four groups of people, current Americans, future Americans, current Bangladeshis, future Bangladeshis. What's happening is you're harming the least well-off group, the current Bangladeshis, to help two less poorly off groups, future Americans, who are the best off of all four, and future Bangladeshis, who are at least better off than the current Bangladeshis. So this seems a little bit odd from an equity perspective. If we don't care about people's position in time inherently, it seems weird that we're going to help people in the future uh, rather than help people now. And this is where it comes down to you, if you say, look, if we, if we went to the Bangladeshis and said, um, here, we're going to give you a million dollars, we can either, we can either spend this million dollars on environmental protection, um, or we can spend this million dollars in direct kinds of aid, which would you like? You know, Sunstein and Puzzler say, look, maybe the Bangladeshis would pick the, pick the direct aid. It would certainly be reasonable for them to do so. Right? We wouldn't think they were crazy for doing that. Uh, now, it's an interesting argument. One thing to keep in mind is that this does rely very strongly on uh, two things. One is it relies very strongly on the idea that environmental harms are just a kind of harm like anything else. So that if the future Bangladeshis have more cars but a worse environment, they might be overall as well off um, as if they had fewer cars but a better environment because you know because we didn't spend the money we spent the money on on environmental protection instead of aid. The other thing is that it, it basically tends to assume that environmental degradation is a fairly incremental kind of thing that you're not looking at massive catastrophe in the future, right? So. If, on the other hand, you believe that uh, it's not just that rising temperatures are going to make food more expensive, right? But uh, if you believe that rising temperatures are going to stop the Gulf Stream and wreck the, you know, wreck the atmosphere, right? Or if you believe that there's going to be, a, you know, a massive oil crash and we're all going to fight each other in a Mad Max world, 
you know, or if you believe that we're going to cook the planet and kill all human life, well, all right, fine. So maybe we need to avoid that because the the um, the effects on the future are so much worse than the effects on the present, even with discounting, even with the economic growth that people in the future will have and that sort of thing. And this raises the last sort of question about present versus future trade-offs, which is, what should you do about things that are uncertain like that? Ultimately, nobody knows whether we're going to get some kind of civil silver bullet energy technology. Nobody knows for sure uh, whether there's going to be one of these vicious feedback loops that will stop the Gulf Stream and kill all life on Earth. We can put some percentages on things, but we're not quite sure about those. I leave it to the environmental policy people to tell me exactly what the numbers look like. So one of the questions that arises is, is it morally justified to um, hold to what's sometimes called a precautionary principle? which is to say something like, look, we don't know where the tipping point for carbon in the atmosphere is before we get really, really bad, uncontrollable warming. Uh, we don't know whether we're, whether we're near that tipping point, whether it's really far away, or whether you know, maybe we've already passed it. So one kind of approach is to say, well, we don't know where the tipping point is, so why should we worry? You know, let's not worry about it that much. Um, you know, we might be really far away from it. Other people say, well, no, we don't know where the tipping point is, so, so, oh my god, let's stop now. Let's, you know, put the brakes on everything. Um, and really what this has to do with is, is it a legitimate political moral principle to say that, at least in the face of catastrophic kinds of harm, uh, you ought to, under uncertainty, take precautions as if the harm were definitely coming or definitely near. And this is tied to an issue of asymmetric risk. Uh, you'll see some people discussing environmental policy who appeal to, um, to the asymmetry between the two different outcomes. Uh, some of you may recognize this as basically Pascal's wager. Where you'll see some people saying, look, we don't, yeah, we don't know whether the Gulf Stream will stop and kill all life on Earth. But that's really, really bad. So let's imagine these two things, right? Let's imagine that the um, environmental, the, the, the worst environmental predictions are true, right? In that case, doing nothing will lead to the destruction of all life on Earth. On the other hand, let's imagine they're false. Well, if they're false, in that case, you know, restraining ourselves, use, driving around our Humvees less, living in smaller homes, using complex fluorescent light bulbs, it's not so bad, right? The risks of the radical environmentalists being right are much, much higher than the risks associated with the radical environmentalists being wrong. So some people will say, under that kind of situation, that's the kind of situation where the precautionary principle is, uh, is, is morally justified. If the, ri if the risks are so asymmetric, you're better off acting as if. You're morally better off. It's morally more appropriate to act as if the worst case predictions are the true ones. You know, but it is still costly, so not everyone buys that. But part of the past versus the present versus future trade-off issue. Okay. The other kind of major trade-off um, that people talk about, and this is less obvious in the readings, is growth versus sustainability. And the basic problem here is we use natural resources to make stuff. We use the environment to make stuff. You know, as as Singer points out, right? Not only do we extract finite natural resources in order to make and do things we want, right? You know, people disagree about how much oil there is, how much you can get out of shale, and that sort of thing. But we all know it's finite. There's a limited amount of it. We also use the environment uh, as part of the process. Uh, this is where Singer really worries about the atmosphere, right? We dump pollutants into the atmosphere as a byproduct of doing all sorts of other cool stuff we want to do, like driving around in our cars and making our iPads. Um, and we know that there's a finite carrying capacity for things like the atmosphere and the oceans. Um, so, if you're talking about economic growth, what you're really talking about is people having more of the cool stuff that they want, doing more of the cool stuff that they want to do. And all of that takes, takes natural resources. So, it seems kind of intuitive, uh, certainly has been intuitive for a lot of people, that you, you can't keep growing the economy forever. 
um, at least not under the current situation that we that we have. Um, this is Herman Daly, late of the School of Public Policy, really worried about this, where the standard uh, Econ 101 models imply that the economy can grow infinitely, and it's usually good to grow your economy, right? You never hear, you never hear a president saying, in my term, um, what I'm what I'm looking for is a zero percent GDP growth. No, people want GDP growth to be higher and higher and higher. Um, but the more you raise your GDP, the more environmental resources you consume. So there is this deep question. It's partly empirical and partly partly moral. The empirical one is the can we, and the moral one is really the should we in a lot of ways. So it's really hard to answer the moral questions without delving into the details of the empirical questions, but there, there are real deep issues about whether or not we can combine growth and environmental protection. You know, so it's a trade-off between growth and stability. Now, it might be that people like Daly are not sanguine enough about technology, right? So some people will say, well, we, we you know, maybe we can't grow infinitely with our finite resources. But the horizon might not be anywhere nearby for at least a couple of reasons. One is that it may be possible to produce more virtual stuff. I have a friend who's big on this. Says, ah, you know, who cares about, uh, about the kind of Herman Daly worries about the environment? We can produce all sorts of stuff that doesn't require that much in the way of natural resource inputs. Um, so take something like books, right? I have a lot of books in my house and in my office that are made out of paper. You know, if you want to make more paper books, you've got to cut trees down. You've got to transport them with fuel all over the place. Um, on the other hand, I also have a bunch of books that live on my laptop or on my tablet. Right? My tablet doesn't get any bigger when I put more books on it. It doesn't require any more resources to run it when I put more books on it. At least, you know, it's got finite memory, but the, the memory is huge. I could probably put a scanned copy of every book I've ever owned in my life on my little tablet. I don't, I don't know if that's true. If we get a CR day, we can probably do it. So, of course, producing this virtual stuff, where right, the electricity that runs my tablet takes natural resources, you know, the, the electricity that ran the computer that someone composed these books on takes natural resources, but much, much less proportional to the amount of stuff uh, than physical things are. So maybe we can at least put off using up all of our capacity by investing more and more in virtual stuff. You know, if, if in the future this, the things that we have are more and more electronic copies, uh, experiences, that sort of thing, then hey, okay, maybe we don't use as much. We still use some. The horizon is still out there, maybe it's just further away. And similarly, well, maybe we can get more resources somewhere, right? Maybe alternative energy will, will save us. Um, you know, maybe we can start making all of our electricity out of things like solar, right? Solar is not unlimited, but when the solar stops, it, there's a lot of it. Uh, and when the solar stops, you know, we're going to have bigger problems like the sun blowing up um, than, uh, than, than we do with, uh, you know, with, with our electricity running out. Uh, now, with alternative energy, of course, the big limitation is it's not clear how close to fruition a lot of these things are. Um, and so, again, you get a moral question, well, how much, how much should we bet on this? Right. Should we keep using fossil fuels, for instance, at the rate we're using them, betting that, well, we'll figure out solar by the time uh, peak oil hits us? You know, or do we say, no, no, let's stop now, at least until we figure these things out. You know, when we figure out solar, then you know, go crazy with your Humvee, but until then, we should stop it. And there might also be addition to alternative energy. There might be resources elsewhere in the universe. I mean, a lot of the, the assumptions behind... Uh, the concerns about the environment are that we, we, we've only got one Earth. Um, you know, maybe there are other places we could go. But again, the issue with things like moon bases is that right now they're more or less science fictional. Uh, we don't have any sort of, uh, you know, there's no moon, there's, there's no moon colony on, on the horizon. I, I don't mean to call Newt Gingrich a liar. He just might be a little bit over optimistic, at least that he could do that, you know, within his term. Now, if you worry a lot about this stuff and you don't think we're going to get the moon base, then this is part of what leads to some of the radical solutions that people have proposed uh, to environmental problems. Um, 
So Herman Daly was a famous advocate of, or is a famous advocate of the steady state economy, where you have a radically different looking economy, um, where the government controls all inputs. The government controls how much electricity, how much fuel, everything that people are allowed to use. You otherwise, otherwise, my understanding of the steady state, at least the daily version, is you otherwise let things run the way that um, people run them, but you radically throttle the inputs to make sure that you've got enough to last for generations. Um, that would look pretty different. You know, that would be an economy aiming at zero percent growth, basically. Um, you also have a strand in environmental thinking that advocates a kind of primitivism. Uh, you know, not completely necessarily, but there are people who, who say, look, we just, at the end of the day, we have to radically simplify our lives. Putting compact fluorescent light bulbs in your house, biking to work, yeah, that's great, right? But it's going to stave off collapse for a couple of years. Um, it, everybody does it. What we really need is to more radically rethink the kinds of lives we, we We currently, especially in the West, we live these extremely resource-intensive lives, and when we talk about international development, often what we implicitly or explicitly need is let's let poor people around the world join in with this incredibly resource-intensive lifestyle that we relatively wealthy people have. Um, that may not be the way to go, say the primitivists. You know, the, the way to go might be to, um, you know, get rid of the incredibly resource-intensive lifestyle that uh, people in the West have. You know, not have a system that is based on owning reasonably large homes and commuting large distances and having lots of electron consumer electronics and labor saving devices and this sort of thing. But, you know, focus on having small homes, living close to the earth, having distributed agriculture, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Now, like with a lot of the radical solutions we, you know, we talked about with libertarianism and with other sorts of things, that's, that's pretty hardcore. You're asking a lot of people if you take these things, but at the end of the day, some people will say, well, which do, you, which do you like more? Do you like your TVs more, or do you like the survival of the human race more? So, uh, tough sell, but at least worth considering as a, as a limiting condition. All right, that's all I have to say. If you need me, I'll be in my yurt.